It meant virtually emptying our life savings account in a financially unstable environment. So it was a big show of faith uh, from my wife to unconditionally say yes to go and build my dream that she wasn't involved in up until that moment. Today on the Second Renaissance, I sit down with Anthony Duckworth from Dear Coco for a virtual flat white. We explore why on earth an international marketing director for one of the world's largest brands would start a coffee card side hustle in the middle of a pandemic. How purpose and gut-based instinct marinated the inception of Dear Coco its role in the circular economy, the human stories he helps shape as he builds community on the side of the London Thames, the business's radical profit and purpose transparency, and how ethical supply chains feed into the story building around Dear Coco. Here's a quick word on my friend and one of my favorite clients, Anthony. Anthony is the owner of Dear Coco Street Coffee in London. Built as a love letter to his six-year-old daughter, Coco, and named top five global coffee truck in 2022 by American Barista magazine, amongst tricks from France, Japan, Romania, and Sweden. Anthony is the father of three daughters, husband and surfer. He has spent 15 years curating humanized experiences to create emotional connections to global brands. In December of 2021, in the middle of a global pandemic, Anthony put his family's financial future at risk to launch a coffee dream that existed only in his head, creating a brand that has changed the shape of street coffee and galvanized a community in London. Anthony focuses his energy on the art of the maximized life, decisiveness in the shadows of uncertainty, I will over IQ, and the community building power of good cup of coffees. I always love catching up with Anthony, whether he wears his corporate attire or his dear Coco superhero swag. Tune in as we decode how Anthony cross-pollinates sustainable business insights from corporate to SMB and back again. Over to you and welcome to the show. Anthony Duckworth, welcome to the Second Renaissance. So good to be here, Anders. Thanks for having me. We sat down together in Byron Bay uh, very fortuitously. couple of months back at a conference um, for the company at which you're an international marketing director. And um, I was so curious to learn about the story that I've been following very, very closely and intensely of your side hustle, which is, of course, Dear Coco, which is this super cool little Aussie style, you know, barista cart in the middle of London. I'm going to kind of just pause there and just go, how on earth does an international marketing director for one of the world's leading brands have the time to then also launch this little side hustle um, that's, you know, enlightening and brightening the mornings of so many Londoners at the moment? Yeah, it's amazing to be here to talk about it. It's... uh in short, you know, I have the most amazing people around me, behind me, uh, in my world that uh, that give me space to go and uh, live my side hustle dream, as well as, like you said, being a, a marketing director for a very large global organisation. So, you know, the people that support me in order to go and be an owner of a side hustle is really the the secret sauce. Of course you know all the effort and all the sleepless nights and all the you know the commitment required will all come as part of the conversation i'm sure but i think it all starts with having a dream and being surrounded by people who are uh, want to support you in living your dream even amongst having so many things on my plate as in you know i'm the father of three daughters i'm i'm the husband to a fourth uh you know i have a, a corporate career i have family i have friends i have so much in my life and so much beauty and so many things but to find room uh, for, for this business that has become my heart has uh, has been an incredible journey, and, uh, and I'm excited excited to share a little bit more about it with you. Yeah, so just just tell me about the the sort of embryonic idea of this. Were you living in 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 Sydney on on the northern beaches, and you sort of had an aha moment um, to maybe move to Europe and explore a career there? Is that is that when the coffee cart idea was was born, or just just kind of give us the The little bit of backstory here of, um, you know, why London, why this sort of wonderful mixture uh, of, you know, global, um, you know, Fortune 500 company, international marketing director, and also, you know, in the mornings uh, serving coffee uh, on, you know, next to the Thames. What's the embryonic sort of origin story here? 
Yeah, so I'm an Aussie surfer. You know, I grew up on the beach, on the northern beaches of Sydney, right around Manly. And, uh, you know, I'm married to a, a French-British uh, woman of uh, 17 years. And, you know, we own a house in Sydney. And about six years ago, we're standing on beautiful freshwater beach. Uh, kids are running in and out of the water. It's a stunning summer's day. And, you know, life looked perfect. And uh, out of nowhere, and I didn't even really realize I was about to say this to my wife, but I, I turned to her and I said, look, you know, you've lived in Australia for 15 years. Have you ever thought about moving back to Europe and giving the kids some kind of European upbringing before they get too old to want to do it? And within a moment, she said, why would you ask me that? We've never spoken about living back in Europe. We're very settled here. We're happy. Look where we are. And I said, I know, but I can see the next 30 years of our life playing out and it looks incredible and it looks beautiful but I can see how it's going to play I feel like we're in a routine that will go on forever and uh and I feel like we've got more adventure in us than just that and within a moment she started crying and saying oh my goodness I I never thought we'd ever move back it's been in my heart for so long but I didn't want to open the conversation so she said yes within about three minutes of me asking and then I was on the hook to make it happen. I hadn't really thought through what that meant by way of, you know, property ownership and career and kids and unearthing, you know, all the logistics that have to happen with a, such a big international move. But, you know, within how many months we had quit our jobs and put a tenant in our house and pulled the kids out of school and we moved to, to London and, and that was uh, six years ago and uh, we've set up the most beautiful life since. But, you know, that meant rebuilding, you know, corporate careers and uh, trying to continue the trajectory that I'd, I had had in, in Australia and, and, and previously London before. So it was a scary moment from a corporate perspective to keep that trajectory going, but it was the first step in really trying to back myself and, and live the dream I, I felt like that the family, uh, you know, might have enjoyed. But then fast forward, and I know we'll get to this separately, but you know we then enter a, a state of pandemic where the channel of marketing that I specialize in is experiential marketing. You know, the, the, the role of that channel of marketing is to bring people face to face with the brand and give them amazing in real life, in person experience, you know, whether it's at an intimate level or at scale. And when all that gets turned down and you try to pivot that whole channel of marketing into virtual, you know, for a guy who is all about bringing people together and giving them personal emotive experiences with brands, that really tested me in that, you know, I lost a lot of what I was about. So, you know, I was kind of wading through those virtual years during the pandemic. And I just remembered a little dream that I had sitting on the mental shelf in the back of my mind in that, you know, I mentioned uh, I'm an Australian surfer, grew up, you know, uh, on the sand. My dream as a retired old man was to serve coffee to the northern beaches surfers running in and out of the ocean, surfing in and around coffee shifts, but serving them coffee from a street coffee van somewhere on the northern beaches of Sydney. But that was when I was going to be 65 years old and a, a retired corporate guy. And I'm sitting there as a, you know, a, a struggling experiential marketing leader who can't practice his craft in its fullest capacity, thinking I need to go and inspire myself and, and you know, really get some, some dreams flowing here. And I, I literally stood in the kitchen with my wife completely unprovoked and, and poured my heart out of which she'd never heard before that I had this dream sitting uh, on the shelf of opening a, a street coffee business uh, in my retired years. And I told her I wanted to bring it forward early by some 20 plus years uh, in order to inspire myself to get out there and do what I love. And that's how Dear Coco was born. That one moment where, you know, my wife said yes in the kitchen amongst Did you go, tears yes, and hugs. Yes, but are you having like a midlife crisis or <laughs> what was the... What was Tell us the full response, Anthony. I'm sure that was. I mean, the first response was, I never knew you had a dream of opening a, a street coffee business. And I said, well, it was parked so far back there that I hadn't brought you in yet. Uh, that was probably in 15, 20 years time when I'm going to start to enter that part of my life. And my wife is, is the most incredible human being in that she didn't have any details. I didn't even have a napkin drawing. I had no business plan. It existed only in my head. And her unconditional response full of love was, of course, you know, I back you 100%. If you tell me you can see it and you think you can make a go of it, but more importantly, it's going to give you what you need in this very challenging period for, for, for us all, 
then you've got my back. Then I've got your back, and it meant virtually emptying our life savings account in in a in a financially unstable environment where corporate career was on unsteady ground. Given my channel of marketing was obviously you know turned down at that time, so it was a big show of faith uh, from my wife to unconditionally say yes to emptying our savings account to go and build my dream um, that she wasn't involved in up until that moment. Yeah, yeah. So in the yeah, in the middle of a little pandemic. Yeah, and look, I'm sure we're all the same in that, you know, our life savings became a giant safety net that we all kind of relied on. And we were all, I'm sure, saying to ourselves, well, how long would that buy me if I end up being on the wrong side of a, you know, a layoff decision or redundancy decision or restructure decision? And in you know, large organizations, that was a very real thing. So let me just get this clear. So you, you've, you've got a potential runway, right, through, through the pandemic, just in case this, you know, avenue of, you know, international experiential marketing, which, you know, translates at least partially to, you know, event marketing conferences. And you're going, let's take that runway and let's, you know, build a coffee cart from scratch um, yeah. next to the Thames uh, in the middle of quarantines and, and lockdowns. Yeah, it was. It, it's it was, totally a logical decision. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it, it flies in the face of every business school manual that you'll ever read. In that, I'm sure the first chapter is have a business plan and write it down. Right? I had written nothing down. I had crunched no numbers. I just I could see it in my head so vividly, and I just believed I could make it happen. And I know that that sounds very fluffy, but that is that is the absolute truth. And once I got my wife's blessing to go and invest that money, of which my natural decisiveness kicked into overdrive and I just raced forward and, and invested the money. I imported the vehicle from Italy and we started spending money on building this business from the ground up. So, you know, we were instantly at the point of no return because that money went instantly to one or two core suppliers who invested that money on our behalf. So there was no turning back and I hadn't written anything down yet. So. You know, it was a big show of faith and it was a large gamble in that, you know, we would have been okay for maybe, you know, eight months to a year with the money that uh, I had just invested. So um, talk about piling pressure on your shoulders before you've even started. So just just, just give us a little timestamp on, on when this is happening. This is, is this 2020 at the beginning or what, like what month are we in here during the pandemic era when, when Dear Coco is born? We're in December 2020 when that decision uh, was made to make this investment, and uh, and why I remember that so vividly is because the you know the corporate brand that I I worked for at the time and still currently work for you know they publicly came out and said there will be no COVID related layoffs in 2020. You know we commit to that as did a lot of other global organisations at the time, right? And that's public knowledge. So. You know, but obviously come the 1st of January 2021, all bets were off and no one was sure how the organisation would restructure itself in order to deal with the new normal, which was still very much in the middle of a pandemic. So I made an investment decision right when my corporate career was on very shaky ground. And that was uh, entire, almost reckless, illogical. I didn't make sense at the time, but my heart was screaming that I needed something because I felt like I was struggling through and I felt like this was the one tonic that I could take that would fix me um, investing in something that I truly believed in that was a dream of mine that I felt like I could do a good job of so you know I entered January 2021 um, living in fear that I was going to get one of those short notice emails from senior leadership that drops in your diary with a few hours notice that says catch up and there's no meeting agenda attached to it and you know that if you get one of those style of invitations that it might not really be good news for you because you might have to move on from the organization so they can restructure themselves and do what they need to do so I lived in fear for many months that I was going to receive one of those invitations and sure enough I, I did uh, in, in January of 2021 um, but I received it from uh, a very senior leader within the organization that would normally have no place uh, giving me a layoff or a redundancy decision. So I took a little bit of comfort in that. And we had the conversation and instantly she said, look, Anthony, your role is not affected. I'm, I'm delighted to say that, but other people in your team have been affected and we're going to structure the organization to be future focused. But, you know, um, we don't envisage you going anywhere. And and I remember putting that phone call down and, and bursting into tears, thinking that pressure was immense at the time because I just invested our life savings. I wasn't sure whether I was going to get moved on from my corporate career. I'd just been given the news that I was okay for the time being. So now I felt like I could really push forward uh, with Vigar to build this street coffee business with the support of my corporate career and really kind of take on the world that I now wanted to create for myself. 
And clearly no conflict of interest here either between corporate career and entrepreneurial small business career. So throughout the pandemic, people talked about the great resignation or the, you know, the great realignment and, and people following their heart and tuning back in with their, you know, what the Okinawans would call their ikigai or their life's purpose. I mean, oftentimes that seems to be a sort of a black or white decision that, you know, Maybe people, you know, become corporate refugees and they start up something totally different. But for you, you you went, no, my corporate employer actually support actively side hustles. And I think you even changed the way you work. Um, so can you just talk us through that a little bit? Because I think it's quite an inspiring story um, of how you've rethought the model of work and also just, you know, the backing from your employer to, to pursue a side hustle. Yeah, and it, it's incredible that they do that. Everything is 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 done out in uh, out in the open. You know, there's no. You know, I've got friends who who want to start or have started side hustles and have to do it in secret because their you know their employer just doesn't uh, support you know um, you know their employees going off and, and living that life because they think it's going to take too much away from you know their their primary focus in their eyes, which is the corporate career. So I I'm very lucky. I work with a brand that encourages you know their colleagues uh, to go off and, and live their dreams and. And, and build their side hustles and do it in plain view of the organization. So I knew that going in, in order to have those conversations that, you know, the first thing I told myself was if I'm gonna do this, I need to create space in my life in order to make it all work, right? Because my goal was with the street coffee business was initially to open it three days a week. If I can hit the rough projections that I'd written on a napkin as to how many coffees and bakes and things we can sell, I can pay it off by a certain amount of time, doing it all myself over three days, and then we'll assess what the future model looks like once it's paid off. So I spoke to my employer uh, in you know very very open view and said, look, I you know I, I lead an international team, you know I work across three different continents. My my diary is uh, very full. Uh, outside of business hours, lots of early morning calls, lots of late evening calls. So, you know, I, I do a lot over five days, um, but I want to work more efficiently. I want to work smarter. I want to be fair on myself and I want to do a compressed work week and do everything I do over four days. Those four days are elongated, but I was kind of doing that anyway. So I didn't really feel like, you know, I needed to work any harder. I just had to work smarter. So I then had a full-time corporate career well set up to do over four days, which is Monday to Thursday, which then freed up those magic three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, to go and build and launch a coffee business, which was only going to be open those three days anyway. So, you know, the model was... Um, I would be the owner and barista until I'd paid off that business. And I thought it might take about 15 months to pay off that business at three days a week based on the rough projections that I'd done. Now, you know, I was delighted to be able to achieve that after seven months, doing it only three days a week. So I'd achieved my kind of, you know, For the debt -free. initial investment. Basically, Initial investment or, paid yeah, off yeah, after seven okay. months at only yeah. three days a week, which astounded me that we were so successful so quickly. So then I could say, okay, now I can afford to, you know, bring in, you know, some team, uh, bring in a team, you know, open up a payroll, um, you know, expand to five days a week and, and really open up the possibility of the business uh, because, uh, you know, we'd achieved that first milestone, which was debt free. Yeah, amazing. And we sit squarely in this space at the second renaissance where we're talking about, you know, creativity within constraints, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, catalyzing creativity and organizations doing more with less or, you know, achieving more while treading more lightly on, on the planet. Uh, yours is a story of, of creativity within constraints and certainly creativity within quarantine. And you've also shared all of these milestones um, in a really heartening fashion. Can you just talk us through that a little bit because you know you're sharing on Instagram and on LinkedIn etc very very transparently so from an ESG perspective environmental social and governance from a governance perspective you're sharing very very transparently how dear Coco is faring uh, the ups and downs and all the rest can you just give us a bit of an insight into that mindset why you do it and and if you're inspiring someone else to to, to get on with their own dreams 
Yeah, no, I I love the role that uh, that Instagram plays uh, for our business. In that, for the last fifteen, sixteen years, I've worked for large global brands, right? So we're very we're very careful um, working within brand guidelines around you know tone of voice and how we talk and how we communicate ourselves out into the public, and that's absolutely what we need to be doing. But you know, when I came over to be a small business owner, I could really think about how I wanted to have a, an online presence that acknowledges that there's only so many people who can come and have a decoco coffee on the side of the river. Are right, but I feel like I've got a lot more to say than just speaking to the people that stop by the van. So I wanted to create an online presence that reflects how I talk and it reflects how I would talk to you if you stopped by the van or if you were sitting in my house having a bottle of wine and we spoke about you know the ins and outs of running a small business or you know how the year is faring or financially how we're going or what our margins will look like or you know if a really horrible situation happened on the side of the river I'd want to talk to you about it right or you know the vulnerability or the loneliness of being a small business owner or whatever it might be a lot goes through the head of a small business owner when they're laying in bed and and, and the room is dark and the mind is racing right and you don't have the support around like you do in corporate where you've got teams and people that are always around it to, to help share the load and 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 hear it so um, i wanted to run an online presence that really made me feel better about telling the stories because i'm a natural sharer and i'm a storyteller but equally i feel better when i talk about things whether it's good things or challenging things so that was the first kind of ethos i want to i want to share how i talk and my audience has, um, you know, we've got a, a burgeoning, almost disproportionately high number of Instagram followers for such a small coffee business. You know, after 20 months, you know, we're nearing 8,000 followers, which in the coffee industry is is something to be really proud of, um, you know, given that we're such a tiny, you know, single location business. But so I'm very proud of that. But what I've found that people have really resonated with most is, uh, you know, the, the authenticity and the vulnerability of the storytelling. And I, I market myself as doing four things, which is specialty coffee, bakes, little sweet shop and storytelling. And that storytelling is either in the form of if you're down on the river with me or digitally online. So, you know, I, I love um, telling those stories online. It's uh, it's almost turned us into as much a content business as it as we are a coffee business, but I feel like the content that we're putting out and the storytelling that we're creating really resonates with kind of human beings, whether they're in small business or aspiring to be small business owners or family people or people just juggling a lot. It's something I'm very proud of and I love doing. Well, I mean, story is is data with a soul. And I think, you know, in in an age of, you know, both the pandemic disruption and now, you know, talk of recession and, and economic slowdowns and, you know, hyperinflation and all of these things, it's it's heartening to see that there's an art and a science um, to a business. And, you know, despite, you know, the glamour and the branding and everything else, you know, there, there's an, very much an art and a science to business. And it doesn't matter how great the storytelling is unless you're also governing the, the, the business in a, in a smart fashion. There's not going to be the type of sustainability for the for the future that we all uh, aspire to and I think it's it's really inspiring for people to, to get that sort of inside view I mean some people might go to the shrink uh, or a psychologist to share you know ups and downs of, of, of a business venture and you're sharing it very very vulnerably uh, yeah. on the side of the Thames yeah and I'd like to add something on the governance piece in that you know a lot of small business owners uh, and I hope I'm not being unfair saying this but just because someone opens a small business it doesn't automatically mean that they know what to do in every situation, right? And managing a hospitality-based business, uh, as it is with many businesses, but in particular hospitality where there's a lot of room for error, sometimes you need people to teach you how to do that. And I'm certainly, you know, not suggesting I'm a teacher, but if I can share what the books look like, like if I open the books to Dear Coco and say, hey, small business community, hey, followership, I've just wrapped our last financial year, Big business open the books to show you what their annual report looks like. How about I open my books and show you what my annual report looks like? You know, here's our annual turnover so you can contextualize, you know, what a business of this size can do. Here's the margins. Here's the percentage on cost of sales of goods. Here's the payroll. Here's the VAT. Here's what we spend on disposables. Here's, you know, where we invest in things like mains power to get us off the generator power. You know, that is like a little masterclass for small business owners that 
that maybe don't have access to you know you know insight like that i mean it's it's all great to google how to run a hospitality business or how to run a cafe but to hear it from someone who's doing it and they're on the journey with me i think that can be quite powerful and if anyone asks me how much money do you make i'll tell them how much do you pay for this i'll tell them how much does a council charge you for that i'll tell them i don't understand why that should be secret um you know there's no ego in play it's all about sharing and and about you know I've, I, I'm going to the trouble of building this database of knowledge. Why wouldn't I share that? Um, so that's that's always been my philosophy. I just had to do a little side glance while I was listening to you there, and, and I remember the, the the movie The Chef with uh, John Favreau that I'm sure you've come across at some stage, where he was um, you know running a, a very fancy restaurant, got a couple of bad reviews, and and um, I think the business went bankrupt or he lost his job as a chef and was on Struggle Street for a while before he launched a, a, a food cart that became super successful with the, with the aid of social media. Is that a movie you've come across or, uh, or are you in uh, you know, a 2.0 version of this? Yeah, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got to be on my list. That, uh, that sounds really intriguing. I haven't had a failed restaurant, but uh, that, uh, that sounds fabulous. It's, uh, look, it's, uh, you know, it's a really interesting model, you know, running a, a street coffee business. We love to talk about sustainability and, and governance and you know, being responsible. I mean, it's a, it's a zero waste business. And I love to talk about this. And I've done a couple of Instagram posts about this in that you know, we are not a, a large business by any means, but we can be very intentional about how we you know, actively participate in this space you know so you would be amazed at how thoughtful and how considered and, and how mindful we can be about running a business which uses disposable products and this, the products with shelf life being coffee milk bakes all those things yet we have zero waste and you know so you can just make very smart supply chain and ordering decisions and and you know having expectations on your suppliers you know whether it's with the coffee roastery that we partner with or you know the dairy that we work with you know or the disposables provider we work with or everything i do on the ground down by the river we can make decisions even at the such a small level which dear coco is which is a, a six square meter patch of earth on the side of the river yet i can be very intentional about what i do and if everybody were to do a similar thing it's incredible about the impact that you can have you know we might use a thousand cups a week you know paper cups a week so what decisions we make around those paper cups is a, a a small decision but it can be quite a powerful one how we treat our our plastic lids going over the counter in that you know we don't just put them on the counter and let people help themselves because i'll do that on autopilot we make people ask you know because hopefully they won't think that we do them so that we save maybe 60 percent of the plastic lids going over the counter when ordinarily they would just take one you know, we, we would invest in, you know, installing mains power along the side of the road so we don't have to run a petrol generator and, and be a little bit more thoughtful around, you know, the energy we use. So, you know, there's a little old lady who comes and collects our used coffee grinds at the end of every coffee shift so she can sprinkle them on her compost. You know, there's, you know, there's all sorts of things that we can do at a very small level that hopefully inspire people to just have those, uh, you know, those conversations. You know, at the end of the day, we have clean runoff water. You know, in summer, we, we water the local plants next to, uh, next to the van with that, right? Why should anything go to waste? So we, we feel great about, you know, the light footprint that we have, even for such a small business. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, we are very much moving from a, a linear economy of take, make and waste to one that is circular and uh it's about recycling repurposing upcycling remanufacturing can you talk us through because you know in in, in the coffee space uh, in the coffee industry whether it's fair trade coffee or whether it's uh you know fertilizers and insecticides or you know the international supply chains or you know the the launches of you know world famous brands like nespresso uh, which was an overnight success that took about 30 years to launch you know there was a lot of criticism of their aluminium based um, pods and, and and them not being recycled initially and uh, Nespresso had to kind of build a, a circular system around those what are some other sort of inspiring stories um, where you guys play in this circular economy to 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 lighten your footprint and you know participate in, in that sort of shift from left lane to right lane yeah yeah coffee's a you know a, a big one in that you know it's such a gigantic industry i i think the last stat i read is that coffee is the most 
consumed beverage uh, outside of water, you know. So it's, it's a big category uh, to, to, you know, think about. And, you know, uh, we, we, even though we are, you know, one of the smallest businesses going around, we place expectations on our suppliers to, you know, go off and, and have the impact that they can have. Yeah, so if you think about the coffee roastery that we partner with, you know, that's by far our largest partner. You know, because, you know, coffee is our core product. So, you know, we, we order a lot of coffee beans a week and other coffee related products, right? So we ensure and we want to feel good about and we almost reverse audit them in, okay, tell us what you're doing in this space so that we can feel good about the story we're trying to tell down on the river to, you know, little, little, little old lady right at the end of that supply chain who's taking the coffee grounds away. What are you doing in this space? And, you know, so they, for example, only work with coffee traders that have personal intimate relationships with the farmers and the growers so that they can ensure the price that they are paid is stable is fair is consistent is ethical so that those coffee based communities are getting well remunerated for the product that they are putting into the system right and that then enables them to deliver a very consistent product into the supply chain and they feel good about that so that's right at the start of the supply chain you know, and then when it gets to the coffee roastery, you know, the processes that they go through in order to roast those beans, get them into tubs and send them out to businesses like mine, you know, nothing goes to waste in that everything that's burnt off the coffee beans, you know, gets pumped into, you know, the, another part of the industry, which, you know, they use fire briquettes with, and they go and ship those all over the UK and they fuel furnaces and fire pits and all sorts of things, you know, with so that waste is, product. This is biomass right? or energy from biomass. Yeah, correct, correct. And, you know, and then the process of getting the coffee beans to me, you know, they'll bring it in large, you know, reusable tubs that get washed out and reused and re-delivered in every week. And the bags that get sold to retail customers are all home recyclable. And that stops, you know, non-recyclables going into the ground. And, you know, all the suppliers, you know, whether it's protein balls or whatever we use, you know, we ensure we use glass products, you know, no single use plastic and so on and so forth. And, you know, even little things like how I order, like with milk that we get fresh from the dairy, that has a week, that is a one week shelf life, right? So instead of ordering 12 bottles a day and getting a van delivery every day, why not get one van delivery every three days? And, uh, you know, given you've got the shelf life to play with, right? In order to be smart about not putting so many vans out on the street just for the sake of my milk order. And then when we get right down at the van level, you know, which is, you know, right on the side of the road where I'm at, you know, I've already mentioned a couple of, you know, small tactics that we do, but, you know, a large one we decided to do was invest in mains power. You know, we were a coffee van parked on the side of the road that was designed with a petrol generator on board just to get us going. Version 2.0 was always going to be try to run this business off mains power, but when you're on the side of the road on the River Thames, mains power isn't just available, right? So that is a process and an investment required to do that. That. But, you know, we spent an absurd amount of money investing in that space, working with the local council, getting planning permission, working with the, the highways division, working with British Gas and umpteen number of providers over an eight month period to get mains power installed in a new piece of street furniture on the side of the road so we could plug our little coffee van in and run off sustainable energy, you know, in a quiet, efficient manner and get off the petrol generator. So, you know, a lot of small businesses wouldn't invest at that scale so early in the business in order to do that. We felt, we felt like it was the right thing to do and the right story to tell, which was, you know, in support of everything else that we're expecting of our suppliers as well as doing on the ground ourselves. I hope the city uh, city council is giving you some solar energy as well, or is it? Uh, do you know where the energy comes from? I don't. It's uh, it's it's a little black uh, box with a door on it that comes out of the sidewalk, and I plug in, and it's tapped into the the street mains power under the footpath. So you know how they feed that grid and what style of energy. I'm not entirely sure, um, but what I can say is that uh, you know a day it costs me to run a, a business uh, of this scale. Uh, it costs me three pounds fifty in energy per day to run an eight hour shift whereas if i was using a petrol generator it would cost me about 15 pounds a day in petrol plus obviously yeah. the harm you're doing with fumes and noise and all that kind of stuff so it doesn't only make sustainable sense but it makes economic sense as well to run off uh, off mains power well i mean esg is all about people planet and profit right and so you're having a conversation now and, and hopefully some influence on, on 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 the city council as well in terms of where that where that mains power comes from but yeah be super interesting story to to to, to look at not just a savings i mean this is i guess you know because you're you're sharing so much vulnerably and and openly about you know the business and net profits and turnover and all the rest and, and we might go back there at one stage but um i mean increasingly now it's you know 
organizations and businesses are also really backing their sustainability initiatives so that there's you know it's not two sets of books but um, certainly their accountability when it comes to doing good by the planet and people and how that feeds into their profitability it's all part of the you know the same storytelling so um, if you're not already doing it I would love to see the ESG reports from uh, from dear Coco as well yeah, I think that's a lovely space to, to move into. That might be a 2023 initiative. Now I've got a head around, uh, you know, what we're doing and how we do it. And we can now start putting some metrics on ourselves. Uh, I think that's a fabulous space to go in and challenging ourselves to learn a little bit more about how we might do that. Because you're right, I, I can't see a lot of businesses really playing in that space. That's kind of left at the moment to, you know, the big end of town. And even then, I, I, I'm not too sure how good a job they're doing. I'm just not educated enough in that space. But uh, no, I think that's a fabulous thing to, to look at. Yeah, I mean, and there are so many, um, even for small businesses, so many great initiatives like becoming B Corp certified and, and, and working with B Corp certified suppliers. I mean, that's a that's a really easy way to kind of go. Okay, well, is my you know, for every deposit I make, you know, as a small business with 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 my bank, you know, am I banking with a bank that still is financing coal fired power plants, or am I banking with a bank that, you know, is doing good by the planet and only works with other B Corp who you know. Uh, ticking the boxes on the highest levels of environmental, social and governance factors, for example. Or, you know, do we give 1% of our profits to the planet, for example? There's so many good little small scale social impact ecosystems that we can participate in as small businesses now. Um, or B Corp, of course, certification, which is global. And it just gives that sort of stamp of approval to, to, the, to the ecosystems of impact that you're working with or your supply chain. And then you, when you scale it upwards, like one of our clients at SAP, uh, through SAP Ariba, there's about $4 trillion worth of B2B sales and deals that work, work its way through SAP Ariba's B2B network every year where they have a big push towards procurement with purpose or purposeful procurement. And there are now brands like GiveWith that are tapping into this seamlessly so that a percentage of every you know, corporate B2B deal goes towards a social impact project. And so it becomes really easy for these corporate partners to kind of go, okay, well, you know, 1% of this deal is going to go towards, who knows, building toilets in, in, in the developing world, you know, UN development uh, or UN SDG number six, for example, clean water and sanitation. You know, that's what we're going to back. And, you know, a seamlessly in the background when this deal happens on SAP Ariba's network, a pretty sizable chunk can go towards really, really important uh, social impact investment. So I wonder if uh, I wonder if that and sorry to cut you off there. I wonder if there's there's any conversation to be had with the payment aggregators who take the payments, you know, uh, at point of sale for small businesses, you know, because, uh, you know, the volume of money passing through those payment aggregators must uh, be tremendous. Uh, you know, I, I, I can imagine a one percent style contribution, you know, off the back of the volume of money that they take. I mean, because obviously it's probably out of scope for a small business to go and have individual conversations with their supply chain but if you could get at scale get some scale through you know uh you know the aggregators uh, by way of you know when everyone touches their uh their credit card that that might be an interesting conversation yeah absolutely i mean you know people have already been doing that kind of thing with you know investing their change you know um whether it's through rays or acorns and you know other players then it goes to your own investments but imagine doing that and you know a certain percentage goes to social impact as well so i mean these are just some of the ideas i'm 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 curious you know now that we're talking numbers and 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 ESG and people planet and profit are you happy to share some of uh, some of the numbers that you you think are quite heartening as a only two year old brand uh, we're recording this in December 2022 uh, what have been some of the highlights some of the challenges um, the type of turnover you've created in in this period of time you mentioned you were sort of break even or you recouped your initial investment at seven months um, any other key highlights that your numbers focused brain is remembering at this stage yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I'm very proud of our numbers, you know, back in my much younger years, you know, I, I used to run restaurants on behalf of owners. And uh, so I know, you know, how, how tight the margins can be. If you could see the small amount of money left for the owner at the end of a trading year of a restaurant, which is a very high risk model, right? You've got a, a lot of staff in play. You've got large brick and mortar rents. You've got a high propensity for wastage, especially if you have, you know, a restaurant style venue. The risk is high. The margins are slim. Um, if you have a quiet month, 
you know, that might put you on the back foot for the entire year. You might not end up turning a profit for the year on the, on the back of just one quiet month. Uh, if you have a pandemic, obviously that's devastating. So, you know, I have a hospitality brain in the back somewhere, even though I haven't exercised it for, you know, 20 plus years, given I've worked in corporate for that long. So I, I, I could already rationalize, even though I was a little bit flippant earlier and saying that I hadn't written anything down. That was absolutely true. But I, I have a hospitality business brain buried back in there where I know what I should be paying by way of percentages on, on all my key, you know, investment buckets. You know, I, I know how how much rent should be if I was a brick and mortar venue. I know how much my payroll should not exceed. I know what margins I should be making on the coffee and the bakes. I know how much I should be spending on utilities. So I had that baked into my brain that I had to kind of dust off when I opened this business. So as I've kind of seen this business grow and you know, I mentioned we paid this off over the first seven months of just working three days a week, given that I didn't have a payroll at the time, I was just myself working free of charge in the business in order to pay it off as quickly as humanly possible because I had the corporate salary to support the family. So I, I didn't have to pay myself from the coffee business. So once we broke that level, I could then start to think, all right, what do I want this business to look like more medium and long term? And the instant decision was to scale up to five days a week, uh, invest in this mains power source, you know, to make us a little bit more efficient by way of fueling the business, bring on a team of baristas. So that opens up a payroll conversation and really start building this business in by way of a small hospitality business. And, and I had the number formula in the back of my head as to what my margins and what my spend buckets needed to be in order to be successful. A well-run, successful, let's just say restaurant as the case study. If you're the owner of that restaurant and it's deemed financially healthy, if that owner pulls five, maximum 10% profit at the end of the year out of that business, that is deemed an exceptionally good result. It is a very, very thin margined business given how much has to go into making that five or 10% net profit, right? So that's the number I had in the back of my head as to, okay, that's what a brick and mortar restaurant model would look like and all the percentages that go into making that. But obviously being a street coffee business, I'm structured a little bit differently and I don't have to spend money in certain areas that brick and mortar venues have to, have to spend money in. So in order to work a little bit backwards, the year we're just about to wrap um, and we're approaching our, our second year of trade here. So I feel like we've got a good year at five days a week running full steam ahead that, you know, I would expect to do going forward. You know, I'm, I'm so happy to put my numbers on a page that, you know, we're going to turn over 145,000 pounds this year, you know, from a tiny little coffee van on the side of the river, only trading five days a week and trading 50 weeks a year because we close for, you know, two weeks of the year. So, you know, those numbers, I think catch people a little bit off guard because a lot of brick and mortar venues operating seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, you know, might not make that amount of money, right? So I'm very proud of what we're able to achieve by way of sales turnover. But I guess where the model really starts taking shape is that in order to have a brick and mortar cafe that turns over 145,000 pounds a year like we do, the rent on that brick and mortar venue would normally be somewhere in the realm of 25 to 30,000 pounds a year, right? That's money that I do not have to spend because I'm parked on the side of the road. The only portion of rent that I pay is about a thousand pounds a year to the council for a street trading license in order to use that six square meters of earth, right? So instantly as the owner, I'm realizing 25, 29,000 pounds a year that I don't have to spend in rent plus business rates, plus utilities, plus cost of heating and water, such a premises, you know, all that comes with. So, you know, already this model delivers back to the family something that brick and mortar venues just can't do. And by way of staff, you know, again, if your staff cost is anything over 30% of your total sales, you're starting to be overstaffed for the amount of money you're taking. You know, my payroll is 18%. So I'm able to run a very lean team and generate the amount of sales, um, you know, that supports a very, you know, good margin on that. And, you know, I have no wastage, you know, I don't have a kitchen, you know, I, re I, I use every drop of milk that comes through the business. I use every coffee bean, I use every bake, nothing goes to waste. So I have zero waste uh, on the P&L. So when all that boils down to it, you know, I, I, as the owner, I mentioned at the start of this, this piece that, you know, an owner of a brick and mortar venue, if they're doing well, might take five or 10% out of the business as net profit. You know, I'm really fortunate to take 40% net profit out of this business because of the way I was able to build it, structure it, keep a lid on costs, 
make smart investment decisions and a bit of luck in that we're successful and people want to come and see us every day and get their coffee. So, you know, I hope that's not an overshare. It's certainly not designed to, you know, um, to, to, to demonstrate any ego or, you know, I'll look at the successful job we've done. But, you know, it's, it's just basic math in that invest in the right areas and staff at the right level and spend the right amount of money and charge the right amount of money. And, and, and hopefully the, the formula works and, and it does in our case. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking like, is there a longer term play here where, you know, we're franchising Dear Coco and uh, it comes with a manual of how to make 40% net profit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's, but it's- like, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because you're obviously you're sharing this and you don't have to go, yep, that's a longer term play. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how many aspiring food truck owners or, or, or coffee cart owners uh, you might be inspiring here who will take their story to the world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very kind of you to say. And it's probably the question I get most down by the van and, and also on social media around, you know, why do you do this corporate gig when you've got something so likable and, and, you know, that translates in the digital world and also the analog world? You know, why wouldn't you just, you know, whether you get an investor or whatever you do and just scale this thing? Two answers to that question. I guess one is I've still got a lot more to give in the kind of marketing director corporate space in that I get an incredible amount of enrichment working in that kind of uh, complex world of, of large global corporations. I lead the most phenomenal team. I, I report to the most inspiring leaders in the US. So, you know, I, I feel like I've got a lot of growth to do in that corporate space. And I feel like me as a, a human being can really benefit from being in that space a bit longer. So, you know, that's, I want to hang on to my corporate existence because I feel like it enriches me and also teaches me how to be a better business owner. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, and, and this is where I risk sounding a little bit, um, egotistical and I'm certainly trying not to compare myself to anyone I, I, I might I might mention here but I love at the moment at least I love the rarity that dear Coco represents in that you know think of all those wonderful restaurants that you love or have heard about or have a reputation for being one of the best right more than likely that restaurant is one of one there's only one of them and the, the chef or the owner, you know, is famous for running one restaurant and they do it to an exceptionally high standard and they diversify through other things. They might do cookbooks, they might do TV work, they might be on the speaker circuit, they might endorse products, whatever they might do, but they keep the one thing as one of one, which is, you know, their restaurant. For me, even I'm by no means in that conversation and, and wouldn't, wouldn't suggest I am. I love the rarity of one of one at the moment, doing something exceptionally well to a very high standard, hopefully adding to the category of street coffee in a positive way in that operating at the premium end where it inspires, you know, other van owners or other coffee people to maybe, you know, want to try to replicate or, or elevate their game. But, you know, I, I love sitting in that space and it being rare, um, certainly, you know, for the time being anyway. So, you know, it is tempting to open up that conversation around delivering scale, but obviously with scale, you lose a little bit of the specialness. That's just the nature of it. Um, and at the moment, that specialness is just something that I'm protecting at the moment and, uh, and, and keeping it as, as one of one. Um, but never say never. But if I did scale, uh, it would need to be done uh, very thoughtfully, very intentionally, trying to maintain the magic of me obviously not being able to be everywhere, but equally just how do I get the magic of uh, the Dear Coco brand, which people tell me does feel like magic, but how do you achieve that at scale, I think would be an interesting conversation because uh, I, I wouldn't know how to do that by myself. I'm, I'm not smart enough. So you're, you're, on, the, you're on the tools, literally. Um, how many days a week are you at the card and, and, and how, does a, how does a morning and an evening look like? I probably do. Now I have a great team uh, in the business by way of baristas. Uh, I, I probably only do one shift every two weeks now. That's probably my, my normal. Um, I might do one shift uh, a week if, if, if a reason came up where, you know, no one could do the shift. I'll, I'll gladly put my hand up. If it's a, if it's a non-corporate working day, I will obviously go down and, and gladly do a shift. It's important for me to do that given the customers only knew me for the first seven months of the business. So it's important that I am still, you know, down at the business. And I love making coffee. You know, I am a barista, a trained barista, as well as a business owner and corporate guy. So I, I love practicing my art. So I do that as much uh, chance as I get. But it's typically once every two weeks uh, around now. But typically, you know, my, my normal day, um, 
would look like, well, we're not open down by the river on Mondays and Tuesdays. We're only a five day a week business. So let's take Wednesday as the example. Um, depending on the time zones and whether I've got calls with Australia as part of my corporate job, because I lead a team in Australia from London. So depending on the time zones and what time of year it is, maybe I might have a very early morning call with those guys. Um, but I'll drive the van um, from my house down to the river. It's less than a mile away, so it's just a couple of minute drive. I'll drive the van down. I'll hand the keys to the barista who will meet me down there very early morning and we'll high five. Uh, we might set up the van together uh, if I want to earn my free coffee before I, I walk back to the house and, and start my corporate day. So uh, I'll either come back to the house and do my corporate day um, or I'll go into the office in central London, depending on what day it is. I'll do my corporate day. I'll keep one eye on the on the sales uh, app on the on my phone uh, once in a while to see how the day is panning out. And obviously, if uh, you know the barista needs anything uh, by way of moral support, if the weather's not good or whatever. And then uh, when my corporate day is finished, it might be after dinner, it might be later in the night, I'll head back to the river on foot and, uh, and go and pick up the van and drive it home. And that's when I spend about uh, an hour just doing general owner's duties, you know, because the van lives at my house. I'll do a little bit of the washing up, I'll do a bit of clean down, uh, I'll restock the van for the next morning, I'll put some filtered water back into the van and just kind of spend an hour just getting, the, getting it business ready for the next day and I'll get up again and do it again. I'll drive it back to the river the next morning in and around you know, my morning schedule and, uh, and come back to the house and, and do my corporate job. So I've compartmentalized my working week in a very efficient manner. None of them ever clash. Uh, if I do have calls that trickle into the early evening or late evening, a van will happily sit there. It's opposite uh, a beautiful pub on the river and the, the owner of the pub and the manager of the pub keep an eye on the van for me to make sure no one does the wrong thing by it if I can't get down there until a bit later in the evening. So I've, I've really set my life up to, um, to have them both work in a lovely, harmonious way. So a uh, couple of questions here. Um, so um, you have to tell us a little bit about the origins of the name Dear Coco. And then secondly, let me know as well um, and let our listeners and viewers know, is there anyone else in the family involved in any of the work, marketing, logistics? How, how does that work? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the first question in that the name of the business is, is my favorite one in that my marketing brain clicked in when I had asked my wife for permission to go and invest our life savings. It's like, well, what are we going to call this thing? And I think I must have written down 50 coffee related names and none of them were working for me. And, uh, and I just thought to myself, look, what connects me to brands? It is, it is the human element. It is, uh, it is the story behind it. You know, the name representing something bigger than just a name. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, I've, I mentioned at the start of the call, we've got three daughters. Our two older daughters are 14 and 13, but then there's a, a fair age gap to uh, our six-year-old. I thought to myself, well, the two older girls are more than likely going to come down on a weekend and, and spend some time at the van. They're going to be a barista assistant. They're going to sweep up the coffee grounds. They're going to help serve the bakes. They're going to get the milk out of the fridge. They're just going to be general hands for the barista working on the business. But what does that do? That leaves our six-year-old daughter completely alienated from the business and not involved and and that would surely be upsetting for us so um, I thought to myself what a wonderful way to involve her as well in that the two older ones get to be involved in the business whereas she gets left out so why don't we name the business after her as a love letter to her now her name is Coco so we named it dear Coco as in this is a family love letter to her because she is the one person who cannot get involved so that set yet. us up <laughs> yet that set us up for a wonderful narrative to surround our social media and, and online content around and, and how we show up as a business day in and day out. It is grounded in family, grounded in being a love letter to our youngest daughter who cannot be involved because she's so young. She helps stick her the cups and pass dad the cups and do all that kind of stuff with some home admin, but she's largely left out. So um, that's the kind of origin story. Uh, and it, it's been something that people have really connected to. And I, I wear on my apron, my name embroidered Anthony on my my apron and in brackets it says Coco's dad so that people can help visualize the story when I tell it to them as I'm making their flat white down by the river. So that's uh, that was answered to your first question. And the second question was around uh, who from the family is involved uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, on the weekend, um, on a Saturday and a Sunday, uh, my two eldest daughters will come down uh, for about four hours and be the barista assistant, uh, whether it's with one of our baristas or myself, and just enjoy working on the van for the day. And uh, it's great for them. They get to see how hard it is to make money, what it takes to make money, how to show up with purpose and intention and humility. And when the 
conditions are challenging. It's been minus six degrees in London here in the morning recently. So how do you show up with energy and, and, and just keep hammering? You know, it is important for them to see what being a small business owner looks like because they've only ever seen corporate directed dad where the paycheck just comes and they don't see how that money happens here they can see how that money happens and they know how much money we take at the end of the day they can visualize how much work went into doing that so when we want to go to winter wonderland here in london which we're doing in a couple of days time they say dad i saw the tickets are like x number of hundreds of pounds they can now visualize how it how how hard it is to make that kind of money so it's a wonderful thing for them to be involved in the business and uh and hopefully one day when we're all sitting around as a family they'll really recount really happy tales of uh of coming and working on the business and tell me as well just remind me as well that i think your your wife is a photographer or or writes food and recipe books is that right just yeah. clarify that that as well yeah, so she runs a, a beautiful business called Emma Duckworth Bakes, and she's a recipe developer, a food photographer, and a content producer, all based around- How, uh, how convenient, Anthony. <laughs> I know, I know. And when, funnily enough, when I was uh, standing in, uh, and she's an author as well, a cookbook author and photographer, I don't know if I mentioned that, but when I stood in the kitchen and asked her for her blessing to, uh, to you know, uh, open the wallet for me to take uh, our life savings, uh, as the ideas were flowing in my head at that moment, I said, what a great way for the general public to potentially taste your bakes that you've only ever produced for clients when you're representing or recipe developing for agencies or clients, you know, when you're heroing their, their food ingredients. So what a great thing to do. How about we bake for the business? And, and that's a way the general public can, can have your world-renowned bakes. And it was all good in theory for about the first month where she was getting up at three o'clock in the morning and using our little domestic oven to bake at a scale that we just couldn't maintain. We were selling way more than we originally thought we would. So within about a month, I, I called stumps on that and said, look, we'll do a few little guest bakes once in a while, but we'll find a bakery partner that can handle the volume that we need to produce. And, uh, and you will be more of a, a silent bakery partner when the, when the opportunity arises. And food photography, is she helping out in that space or has some of the amazing photos on Instagram, etc.? Where does that all come from? Yeah, so she, uh, I imagine there's two ways to run an Instagram feed. One is a very curated fashion and one is more of a raw fashion. I run a very curated fashion in that I want it to be aesthetically beautiful on the eye when you look at the at the feed and then with all the rich stories sitting behind it so i wanted nice imagery uh, to help tell the story so as version one of uh, or chapter one of our online presence uh, my wife came and took a huge library of beautiful photos over a series of many weeks and many days of just the van being in business and uh when a photographer takes so many photos of one subject there's only so many ways that photographer can see that subject so i then enlisted a travel photographer friend of mine who also lives not far from the Deer Coco site and through her eye you know she came down and took our I guess chapter two library of photographers which I'm still drawing down on and I have a lot of fun with and uh yeah it's gone a long way to helping us with our Instagram followership so I'm very proud of it yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing amazing we're nearly into the to the end zone here Anthony are there any um any other things that we should know about anything in terms of where to next in 2023 or inspiring wisdom yeah, I think one thing that I'm tremendously proud of, and we spoke about the financials, we spoke about building a business and trying to establish a brand and all those wonderful things and sustainability and, and you know, ESG and governance. We spoke about all that wonderful stuff. But I think one thing that I'm so immensely proud of is that if you go onto the London Underground, it is notoriously cold. And when I say cold, I don't mean temperature, I mean temperament in that no one looks at each other, no one gives each other the time of day, even if someone is expressing need for help. People are just very intentional about keeping to themselves, not showing vulnerability, not showing a community spirit and really keeping to themselves. And, and that's fine, right? It's a, you know, that, that, that's, that's shared uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot of public transport systems around the world, right? That's not unique to London. But what I find is that if you transfer the same 20 people that are standing on that London underground carriage, and if you transfer them to the Deer Coco coffee van on the side of the Thames, you'll get a very different human experience in that you will instantly get a community of people that want to talk to each other, want to help each other, want to share stories, share insights, have a laugh, you know, have some social commentary together, you know, rebuild connections that maybe they've got through their digital, digitally fatigued lives or they're feeling a little bit alienated sitting at home four days a week working, whatever it might be. 
having a coffee down by the river from a beautiful van full of emotive spirit like Dear Coco, it brings some humanity to the surface that I think is not captured everywhere. And I don't know what it is, whether it's the ritual of just getting a coffee, whether there's something magic in that, that place where we are, whether it's the Dear Coco experience, whatever it might be, maybe it's a combination of things, but the humanity and the community spirit that we get down by the river at that van is just so heartwarming. And, you know, we not only get strangers speaking to strangers, we get community overhearing other new members of the community, adding them to WhatsApp groups, saying, if you ever need a hand, stop by, offering support to the barista team, saying, it's minus six degrees out here, here's a hot water bottle I brought you, or here's some hand warmers, or here's a, a pot of cold, a hot soup that we brought you. It just brings something magical out in the community. And I, again, it is just something that I'm so incredibly proud of. And this customer the other day, uh, she just went through something incredibly painful in her life, and she really suffered as a result of it. And um, and you know, she came to the van, uh, you know, a couple of days later, uh, and, and and I saw her, and she said, Anthony, I just want to pass on a moment of gratitude. She said, something terrible happened to me a few days ago, and I have loads of friends around the community, and loads of family, and loads of people I want to speak to. But the only place I wanted to come was Dear Coco to see you guys because this is my happy place where you won't judge me. I can be my whole self. I don't have to sugarcoat anything. You're not going to spread any word or you're not going to be judgmental. I can just come and be myself and it's a safe space and you guys are going to take care of me. And I just saw, and she said, that was just an incredibly powerful thing for me in a very vulnerable moment. So she came back a couple of days later and said, I just wanted to thank you for building a business that has given me that. And I just kind of went, Oh, here I am selling coffee, bakes and little sweets on the side of the road. And you've just told me that we're really important in a very, very difficult moment of your life and that we made you feel brilliant. So um, that for me was a real lovely yardstick as to where we've got to with this business. And, and I guess a happy note to, to finish this conversation on. I mean, we, we, we met many moons ago. I think it was um, probably seven years ago and, and we were working together on, on an event series for a big financial institution, a big bank you worked for in experiential marketing previous employer and I think at the time we were you know working with financial advisors and, and, and investors and you know insurance companies etc insurance brokers to get this concept of digilog how to win the digital minds and the analog hearts of tomorrow's customers and it's just it's wonderful to see that you're winning the the, the digital minds and the analog hearts uh, through your very digilog story uh, but you're also in the process creating community in a way that's good for people planet and uh and evidently profit as well and it's it's you know it's nice to see those things working in harmony i can't wait to have some uh some almond croissants and some great strong flat whites down at your coffee cart on my next visit to to, to london Oh, our doors always open, Anders. It would be a, an honour to have you by the river. And uh, thank you so much for this conversation and shining a spotlight on such a, a small business. I'm sure we are the most analogue conversation you've had on this series for, for quite some time in the smallest form. But uh, we're a human story and that's what I'm so incredibly proud of. So thanks so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. And just uh, finally, where can people learn more? You've mentioned Instagram. What are some of the uh, hashtags or some of the at tags that we should be checking out? Yeah, so uh, we just have one uh, one social media presence because it's long form. It's Instagram. I can't fit all my stories into a small amount of characters like Twitter. So uh, head on to Instagram and our account is Dear Coco London and uh, you'll join uh, the community there and uh, we have a lot of fun with it. The business falls under my wife's uh, you know, bigger business, which is emmaduckworthbakes.co.uk. So check her out as well. She's a, she's a phenomenal talent. Thank you so much. Enjoy uh, Winter Wonderland and um, yeah, look forward to, to seeing you in, uh, in the real analog world and the not too distant as well. Thanks, Anders. Great seeing you. Thank you. For more information about the second renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersumanilson.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the second renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.